Okay, today we're going to keep going with our start of optimization, sorry, our start of control. And we're going to start off, though, by talking about, um, as everything else in this class, of course, formulating control problems as optimization problems. Uh, optimization is this framework we've been using this, this whole time, and it really can transfer just as easily to a setting like control, where we have to now make decisions um, over time that will affect the evolution of a system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the way we formulate control, where we're going to think about control, which is a, a general subset called, called optimal control, though we can't always get the exact optimal solution to a lot of problems. I'll talk about how we formulate that as, as an optimization problem. Um, then I'll talk about some examples. Uh, I think a lot of this control can quickly get pretty abstract, um, especially when we start talking about the specifics of dynamical systems and the specific properties of, the, of these systems, um, like controllability or observability. Uh, these things get pretty abstract pretty quickly. And so the point of these examples is they're both pretty simple examples, and we'll cover ones that are more complex later on in the course. Um, but the point of them is just to sort of give you an intuition about what the issues that come up with control are and how we actually go about solving them in this optimization framework. And really how powerful optimization can be for solving some pretty apparently complex problems. Um, and, and we'll talk about, I mean, again, they're actually quite simple because they're you know, maybe single state or one control. Um, but yeah, when you think about kind of coming up with a with a policy or some sort of action that you want to take beforehand without really knowing a formal framework, they can still be pretty tricky. So we'll talk about one heating and then energy storage. And finally, um, after the sort of introduction with these examples, we'll delve a little bit more into different types of systems. Um, and so the next set of lectures will be on dynamical systems of different types. And we'll run through several different types of such systems. And then after that, we're actually going to run through several different ways of controlling those different types of systems. And that, again, using examples from power systems throughout and from the smart grid throughout. Um, but that will be kind of the, the outline of the rest of, the rest of this unit. Today, we'll hopefully get to a little bit on linear systems, uh, maybe even also on partially observable systems. But we'll, we'll, uh, won't try to push it too fast. Um, the other thing is we'll try to end a little bit early today so we can give out the homework and talk about a few of the problems that, that there were issues, um, I think, for a lot of the different homeworks. All right, so um, let me actually just erase this and sort of rewrite our general setting we had here. So you remember, we had a state the variables we're sort of concerned about were a state xt in Rn. That was the part of the system that kind of matters, affects us how it evolves, but we can't directly set, like the temperature in a room. We also had input, which we're going to call a vector ut in Rm. Again, these. Um, Notations for N and M now are not the same as they were for machine learning or for power systems. Um, the reality is these are just the terminology people use in this area. So you will almost always see the state being n-dimensional, the input being m-dimensional. And so it's good just to get familiar with this notation here. Um, you will have to deal with a lot of notation as you work in areas like this. So I figure we might as well get used to it in the class. Um, though I'll try to keep consistent within one unit. I'll try to keep consistent within that one unit. Um, so we have state and, state and input, and then we have the, the dynamics of the system, which for discrete time, you remember, is an equation of the form xt plus 1 equals f of xt and ut. And this prescribes how, what the next state will be given the current state and given the current input. So as I said before, the state could be something like a temperature in a room. The in input could be something like um, the heater, whether you turn on a heater on or off. And then those together will affect what the state the next time will be, say, maybe five seconds in the future or something like that. Now, the paradigm of 
control which we'll use in this course is one called optimal control. Control in general really is just about, well, pick any way of picking actions to get some effect on the output. And so it's a very kind of general um, problem, control. It isn't really a well-formulated problem even. And so we're going to use this uh, paradigm called optimal control, where we formulate what we mean in terms of our control objective. We formulate what we want out of the system. And the way we do that is through a cost function. Right? So in addition to all these things, we're going to have a cost function. This is a function that takes as input a state, an Im a input vector, and outputs some non-negative cost. Right, so this is a function from Rn and Rm to R plus. And this is a lot like the loss functions that we had for machine learning, right? It's some notion of kind of badness. Where in machine learning, the notion of badness was essentially how far apart is our prediction from the actual value. In this case, the notion of badness is just for some state x and control u, how bad is that? And so, for example, you might have a cost that says, um, you know, being outside of 68 to 72 degrees for your temperature in the room, that's bad. And maybe we'll have a quadratic cost that rises outside of that. We also might say having the, the heater on too high. So you don't want to you know, turn the heater on full blast. You want to have it kind of in uh, some sort of middle range. And so maybe you might also have a penalty on you. You also have a penalty on using the heater at all, right? Because maybe just we don't want to use the heater when we don't have to. Or if we had a heater and a cooler, you probably wouldn't want to maintain temperature by constantly turning the heat on to be too high, then cooling it back down. That would be probably a pretty inefficient way of doing things. So maybe you just put a penalty on you as well. And we'll talk about the costs that we have um, a little bit later in some example problems. But essentially, this cost tells us for a given instant what is bad. For a given single state and single control, what's good and what's bad. And the goal of optimal control, and this is really all there is to it in some sense, is we want to pick a sequence of actions. Remember, the control setting is not just a single state, but actually states over time and systems over time. So the goal of optimal control is just to minimize the sum of costs. Right? And this sum of costs here is also something that's called a cost to go or a value function. But I'll call it here a cost to go. That is the sum of costs over some time horizon t. So we'll call this j, and this equals the sum from t equals 1 to big T of the cost of xt and ut. Right, because if we want to, and actually, for now, ignore this. Obviously, we're also, these are also subject to the dynamics of the system, right? We can't just sort of pick whatever controls we want. But for now, the actual cost to go is really just defined as this thing. And we'll talk about this constraint in a second. But what this is saying is, we don't, if we, if we want to take good actions in some sense for a, some window of time, right? We want to plan good temperatures in a room for a whole day, not just this second. Um, because if we put a high cost, for example, on, on the heater, maybe right now, and we don't really worry too much about the cost, maybe on the immediate term of the, of the heat, Maybe you get a situation where you wouldn't really want to turn the heater on right now, but if you think forward a little bit, you would want to turn the heater on because in that case, you would actually warm up the room a lot, and so it would be better to do that. 
That's a little bit of a contrived example, but you can imagine cases where the instantaneous cost that you incur right now would not be the same as what you want to do if you're thinking ahead. Right? If you're actually planning ahead to not just have low cost right now, but also have low cost in the future. So the goal of control is just to minimize this function. We want the of optimal control in particular. Formally, we want to take actions that minimize this cost over many time steps. There's also a continuous time formulation of that, but it's the same thing. All you do is you just replace the sum here with an integral over time. As I said, we're not going to worry too much about the, just the continuous time formulations in this class because we're solving things on a computer where everything is ultimately going to be just discretized anyway. Um, but mathematically, there are some cases where I'll, where I'll bring this back up because a lot of the laws of physics, for example, can best be described in, ter in terms of differential equations, not in terms of sort of discrete dynamics. We have to approximate the laws of physics using discrete dynamics oftentimes. So that's all there is to control, really. Just minimize costs over some horizon. Yeah? How is the different uh, time formulation look between the two? Like, if you're saying seconds, what well, is so, discrete? Or? So the discrete time formulation doesn't really specify what the time interval is. It's left ambiguous. And this is actually a good thing, because oftentimes you, you don't really care. I mean, oftentimes the time scale you care about is problem dependent, right? So you don't really care about maybe temperature millisecond to millisecond because it's just not going to change that fast. Whereas there are some processes in electronics, for example, that you really do care about millisecond by millisecond are much faster. Um, now that's the same thing goes for continuous time too. Um, oftentimes you'll, you'll make a more sort of a smoother approximation to maybe the true dynamics of a system uh, when you when you think about the continuous time formulations. But the discrete time, which is the one that we'll use, does not say what this time interval actually means, what x t plus 1 means. Uh, t here is just a time index, and t plus 1 is the next time. So that could be the next day, it could be the next millisecond, it could be the next second, or anywhere in between, and on the farther out, too. So so really, it's it's much more about what's important to the problem than what is sort of some, you know, canonical time difference. And that makes sense in terms of the optimal control too, right? Because um, both in terms of picking this horizon, what's the, you know, what, how, how far ahead do you really want to look? Um, you know, should we schedule this room to make, to really be sure we can do it not for now, but for the next hundred years too? Um, probably not. You probably wouldn't really want to think about that. Um, and there are some formal reasons actually why you definitely should not think about that even other than the obvious intuition. But in terms of the control problem, you also have this issue of picking the right time resolution, right? You probably want to think, you know, depending on what your time steps are, that will tell you really how long ahead you're looking when you talk about this horizon t. And so you probably want to schedule the temperature in the room for, I don't know, maybe a couple hours ahead. Probably more, maybe more like a day ahead, but maybe a couple hours ahead would work okay for doing that. Uh, it really is very problem dependent. Are there any other questions here? This is a pretty simple idea, but it also is, is very fundamental to all that we're going to do with control. So it's worth kind of getting this very concretely. Okay. So now that we have this formulation, let's talk about control as an optimization problem. And as you can imagine, it's pretty simple. Um, I'll write it down here, though, even though it's on the slides, because it also is very important. So I have to erase all this. Well, maybe I'll like just write it at the end or something like that. My Optimization problem will actually include it that term anyway, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, in optimization now, the goal is to again minimize this cost function, um, but we can't 
sort of let the variables be anything they want, right? Because the x variables, at least, are determined by these dynamics. But the way we're going to formulate this is actually a little bit interesting. We're actually going to have an optimization problem where both x and u, and this notation just means, you know, x variables from 1 to t and u variables from 1 to t. We're going to formulate it as all these things are optimization variables, actually. Right, so we're actually going to optimize over all these things, but we're going to add the dynamics of the system as a constraint. Okay, so even though we're optimizing over x, and x is an optimization variable, it really is going to be completely determined by these constraints that we have. So the problem is we want to minimize over x and u, and I'll leave out their indices here, I just mean all the indices there, uh, the sum of these costs, t equals 1 to t, of the cost of xt and ut. And that is just our optimal control objective, right? That's just what we want to do. We want to minimize over all those things the costs. Uh, yeah. So, 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 right. So, in an optimization problem, um, we're letting these both be variables, but because we add constraints that constrain what they possibly could be, we are not actually allowed to really set them, other than through by choosing u here. The reason why we do this is that it's much simpler to write things like this than it is to explicitly write the sequence of evolution of the states. So, so maybe this is maybe a good point. I don't know if we'll quite get this in the... So, so I'll try to get it at the bottom here. So right, so x2, for example, say x1 is known. Um, x1 is our initial state, that's, that's given to us. We can't change that. x1 is known. x2 then would be equal to f of x1 and u1, right? And so that, that's just an assignment. We, can, we don't have any control over that other than we can pick our actions u. x3 equals this same thing for x2, but let's just plug in our formula for x2 here because, you know, all we really know as input is x1. So this equals f of f of x1, u1, and u2. Right? And this is really what you put the cost on here. Now, as you can imagine, pretty quickly this would get very cumbersome to write it out like this, right? You have a lot of these dynamics iterated again and again and again, and it gets really kind of hairy, these, these constraints. It's become very big, potentially, if these are nonlinear, they become nonlinear constraints. You can certainly write it all out like that, and for some systems it actually is perfectly fine to write it out like that if you want to. Um, but it's really advantageous to, rather than let these, rather than sort of try to eliminate these variables from the optimization problem to begin with, we actually l let them be variables in this problem, and we just add constraints to the problem that enforce them to obey dynamics. So we don't really control them. We can't really set them because they have to obey these constraints. So they still have to obey the dynamics of the system. It's just much easier to write things this way than it is to sort of write out for every x what it has to be based on just a function of the past use. Um, so, what the problem is, again, minimize over both these things, but then importantly, subject to the constraint that x t plus 1 equals f of xt ut uh, for all t equals 1 to t minus 1. So again, x's are technically variables in the optimization problem, but they aren't really something we can set. They're something that have to obey these constraints, and so effectively the only way we can really control them is to set the use.
I probably should have also added here. So what I also added here was arbitrary other constraints. So we can also constrain things, other things in other ways. We could add constraints on the controls, for example. We say you can't turn on the heater more than 100% power, right? That would be a reasonable control, um, a reasonable constraint on the controls. These can come in the form of either inequality constraints or equality constraints. And in fact, an important equality constraint that we sort of have to have is that these equations only constrain uh, states 2x2 to xt. They don't constrain x1 just with these constraints, right? You don't want to treat x1 as a free variable. x1 is just the initial state of the system. So one important constraint to add, for example, which would be bundled in to these equality constraints here, would be the fact that x1 equals some, I'll just call it x init or something like that, some initial state that is the actual current state of the system that we want to start from, right? But more generally, we can add other constraints. We also constrain things like um, if a, the state of a system is the state of charge level of a battery, there's a physical law that we can never have negative charge in the battery, right? And so that is easily described just by a constraint on the state in this formulation here. So all these things can really be kind of nicely described by this formulation. We allow for both constraints in the states, uh, the constraints that have to be obey the dynamics of the system, as well as some other arbitrary constraints like this. Now this written like this is a very, very general formulation. Right? A lot of problems can be framed in this framework. And a lot of ones that are very hard to solve, in fact, can be formulated like this. Uh, which isn't surprising, given that these sort of equalities here can be very complex, right? We can have very complex dynamics in those problems. Now the practical problem is when you include things here that are, say, nonlinear or that are non-convex in the constraints, the problem is that this makes them hard to solve, right? These are now an optimization problem that is no longer convex. Um, you know, we can solve some of them with Newton's method, but Newton's method is kind of a local method, right? If you find kind of a good starting point, uh, you might be able to find a good solution from that starting point. If you have no idea what your starting point is, it can be very hard to find anything. And so things like Newton's method, or they're not quite Newton's method because you have inequalities here, but it's things that are very similar to Newton's method actually still. These things can be very hard to, uh, to really solve. So again, this is a very general formulation here, but we haven't yet really gotten anything concrete in terms of a problem we can solve. You could plug a lot of these into YALMIP, for example, and YALMIP will try to solve nonlinear problems. Um, but if you ever tried it, or you might try it on the next homework, I don't think we, I'm asking you to try it, but you're writing a power flow solver, for example, for the next homework. If you just plug the power flow equations into YALMIP, it won't be able to find a solution. And this is a very simple problem, right? Newton's method works fine for it, but yet these general solvers still aren't very good yet at handling even reasonably complex kind of nonlinear tricky constraints. And so for a lot of systems here, you won't be able to actually solve it. OK, so from that, let's talk about a few cases where you actually can solve it. Right? And this is actually why, even though this seems like a very limited subset of, of problems you can solve, it actually, the problems where you can solve this oftentimes form the basis for solving much more complex problems. And this is actually ends up being a very, very powerful technique for solving um, general control problems. Or this and then approximations on this ends up being a very general technique. So the basic idea here is when can we solve this optimization problem? And the simple answer is, well, we can solve it when it's convex, right? That's sort of what we saw at the beginning of class that, again, you know, it isn't quite true. <laughs> but in general, for many convex problems, 
they can be solved very efficiently. And a good demarcation between problems that are easy in some sense and problems that are hard is between problems that are convex and non-convex. So what's required to make this convex? Well, first of all, these things, inequality constraints and inequality constraints, have to be convex themselves. Right? Those have to be all be convex. Let's just leave that at that. But the important thing is that these dynamics have to be of a certain form. And this is, I guess, there are other cases where you can also convexify things a little bit. Um, you can actually do some very powerful things with polynomial systems, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, in general, an equality constraint is only convex if it's linear. Right? Equality, so, sort of a, a, a inequality constraint is convex if it's the, the form some convex function g of x is less than or equal to 0. And for it to be equal to 0, well, you need it to be both less than or equal to 0 and greater than or equal to 0. So g has to be both convex and its negation has to be convex. Um, and that means it has to be linear or actually affine. Affine just means linear plus a constant term, too. <coughs> so, I mean, that's, that's sort of an aside. Hopefully that you've seen a little bit like this, you know, seen a little bit of this before. But basically, the only times where we can have a constraint like this that is actually solvable in a standard complex optimization package is if this is actually a linear equality here. And you saw this in your, in, for example, the standard form for quadratic programming. You had to have, well, you had ax is less than or equal to b. And the only way to make ax equal to b is if you can have both, you basically add both that term and the inverse of it. And um, so it has to be this linear term, which, right? It has to be the form ax equals b to be an allowable constraint in a, in a quadratic program. You couldn't have, for example, x squared is less than or equal to, or x squared equals 0 as a convex constraint. So what this boils down to is that the cases that this can be solved efficiently, or a large swath of the cases, boil down to the following. First of all, we have to have a convex cost function. All right, so maybe our cost function could be, you know, squared error of how close the, the state and control are to some desired settings. That would be a convex cost function. We also have to have these linear dynamics. And one example form of these would say that xt plus 1 equals some big matrix A X T plus a matrix B U T plus maybe some additional affine term here that varies with time. You could have extensions to this as well. For example, you could have the A matrices depend on time. Um, it's important though to know that in this formulation, these A's and B's and AT's, they are all known. They are not variables in the problem. They are all assumed that we know them. Um, we'll cover linear systems in a lot more detail in a little bit. We'll give some examples in the next few slides as well as talk a lot more about the theory of them later in this lecture. Um, so hopefully this will make a little bit more sense as precise form if you haven't seen it before. But from the optimization standpoint, the reason for this form in some sense is that it is one of the few forms we actually can optimize. And then, of course, these also these constraints here also have to be convex. There'd be things like ax less than or equal to b, uh, and things like that. You can actually have more complex constraints when you allow for inequalities. They don't have to be linear, but they have to be convex. And we won't really harp too much on sort of the types of functions you can have there that are nonlinear but convex. But that's just going to be the the line of what's allowable here. And again, if you have a problem like this now, where this holds for everything, these are all convex, this is linear, you will be able to plug it into a solver like Yalmip and solve it because it will have sort of the, 
ability to handle convex constraints here. You'll set up equality const constraints, linear equality constraints for the dynamics, and then it'll minimize the cost over all that. Yes, A and B are all, that's very important, A and B are known here. Uh, this is the case where you have some dynamics, dynamical system that you know. And in fact, in general, this function that maps states and inputs to next states, we're going to assume this is always known. We're not going to be worried about learning this function. We're going to say that this function is given to us by physics, right? Um, we'll talk, actually I take that back, we'll talk a little bit about cases where you have to learn that from things like machine learning, but that will be kind of a separate phase. And the control part of, the, of a portion, we're always going to assume this is known. Because if it's unknown, then you don't, this constraint really doesn't mean anything, right? What does this constraint mean? This is unknown too. It could, you sort of have that freedom again to let x be anything um, if it's unknown. Uh, so, so you don't want that. You want to have this be an actual constraint. And for that to be the case, this has to be known. This function has to be known. And so in the case of linear systems, then um, A, B, and little a are all known. All right. So I want to go through a few examples now of what, you, what types of things you can do in a framework like this. And these are, they're meant to be simple examples. We'll get shortly to much more uh, sort of, you know, they'll actually be very similar in some sense, but they'll be larger scale. Right, so the state here at each time is, for example, going to be one dimensional every time. So you just have one variable that's the state at each time. Um, and you, of course, in general, you can have much more than that. The state could be not just the temperature in one room, but it could be the temperature in every room in a building. And these are all related in interesting ways, right? But we're going to talk about now some pretty simple examples, but they hopefully drive home the, the, really the power of control via optimization, because it really is a powerful paradigm. So let's take one example of heating a room in a building. And to say this building actually is you know, it's a single building, so there's only one external temperature, and that's the only thing that affects how the temperature evolves along. The external temperature and then also the heater affects how temperature evolves. So our goal for the task, we have some building, we have some outside temperature, which is going to affect how heating evolves given basically heat diffusion. I mean, the outside is cool, then the room will cool as well at some rate. And I'll give the actual equation for that in a second. Um, but we have some outside temperature. And we also have some bounds on the allowable temperature inside the room. This is actually kind of like a cost function in some sense, but we're setting up as a strict cost function. You cannot violate these things. So we'll actually encode them as constraints rather than as costs. But essentially what this says is that this room is occupied, say, from you know, 9 to 12 and then from uh, 2 to 5 or something whatever those hours are. And so when the room's occupied, we want to have a temperature between 68 and 72 degrees. But when it's unoccupied, you don't really, you can have a much wider range, right? You don't really care if it's unoccupied. I mean, you don't want pipes to freeze, so maybe you shouldn't have it go to freezing, but we'll even keep it in some less narrow range than that. We'll just sort of say it can be anywhere in this range. And as you would imagine, if you can do this, you could actually save some energy, right? Because you don't have to keep the room in the set point the whole time, you actually can let it cool off if there's no one there. Now this does assume that we really know when people are going to be there. If you don't know that ahead of time, it can be tricky, right? Because someone could come into a really cold room and they wouldn't like that. Well, let's say that there's a really good scheduling system here or whatever, and we, and we know ahead of time the room is going to be uh, occupied during these two times. Later on, we'll talk about how you can use things like machine learning to actually predict things like this um, and take into account the fact that you're not positive in your predictions. You might be wrong sometimes. So what do you do then? So those are all kind of issues that come up. But for the simple case, we'll just assume we know someone's going to be here, here then and someone's going to be here then. In addition, actually, no, sorry, I don't have it quite yet, the last point. But 
Let's talk about how the dynamics of the temperature of the room actually evolves. So the dynamics of temperature evolve according to essentially heat transfer. Right? And it's a really simple first order differential equation. Uh, I won't actually even bother about all the terms here. I think this is uh, pressure and uh, specific heat and volume, but those are just some constants. Uh, what it says is the derivative of the temperature with respect to time equals negative, some more constants here, this is the, the area of transfer and this is the heat co heating exchange coefficient, I think. Um, which the, the rate of heat transfer, essentially. I forget the exact name of it. Um, but basically, it says this derivative evolves according to some constant times the current temperature minus the external temperature. And the negation of that, right? So what it says is, okay, if, let's suppose that the external temperature is lower than the current temperature, right, then this thing would be positive here. These constants are all positive as well, so we scale this by some constant, and then we negate it. So what this is, is the derivative of the current temperature is going to be negative. That means if the outside is cold on the inside, our temperature will tend to decrease. Similarly, if the outside is warmer, then this term will be negative, so this whole term will be positive, and the temperature will increase in the room. And this is just essentially, and also by the way, if these are equal, then it will not change. This just governs how, a very simple expression that governs how heating, you know, treat, treating the, the whole room as a single instance, not worrying about sort of the actual diffusion of the different particles in the air or anything like that. How the entire temperature evolves in a really simple first order equation. Now, to put it in our framework of <coughs> sort of our linear systems, we can easily do this because we'll define the state xt to just be this temperature of the room. Right? So the state is a one dimensional variable that is the internal temperature of the room at time t. It's this big t variable. That's the state. The control is some additional energy we inject into the room at time t. For example, by turning on a heater. And what this corresponds to really is it even if we take this then and you know, wrap all these constants plus the time step that we have plus everything into a single bundle um, using the Euler approximation at least. You can do it a couple other ways as well that for this would be a little more precise, but we'll use Euler approximations here. What you get is the time at time, the, the temperature at time t plus one equals temperature time t. Remember that's sort of the Euler integration is equals that plus delta t times the derivative. So the derivative can be written as just this term here. It's some constant times the external temperature at time t minus the true temperature. Just for notation, I actually reversed those just so that we don't have a neg negative here. We have actually it's a positive. And then plus some other constant, which I'll call b, times our control action. And so hopefully it's clear this is of the form of those linear systems we talked about before. Right? Because Essentially, sorry, an affine system, technically. So remember, the definition of an affine system was x t plus one. I'm kind of running out of ink here. Equals a x t plus b u t plus a t. Right, and here, a t would just be, well, there's a, a 1 and then a minus k x. So that will be 1 minus k. The b term is just this little b. That's just how the heating affects. the temperature. And then a t here would just be 
k times t external. Another thing that's important to note here is that we're also going to assume here that we not only know what the set points are going to be, but we also know exactly how temperature will evolve in the future. So we're going to assume that all those little ATs are all known. Again, this is a case where you won't really know it in practice. You might use a machine learning method to predict that or use a weather forecast, which essentially is much more detailed models, but still sort of a combination of physics and data-driven models to predict how temperature will evolve. Um, for now, though, let's assume that we actually know all these things. So we know K. We, that essentially tells us how leaky the room is, right? We know the leakiness of the room. We know B. We know how the heater will affect the temperature in the room. And we know the entire sequence of external temperatures. So we know how temperature outside is going to evolve during the course of a day, say. Maybe not ahead of that. We don't really care. We just want to schedule for one day ahead. So this is a, actually, it's really an affine dynamical system here. This is actually, does everyone know? So affine just means there can be an extra constant term here, whereas linear means there is no extra constant term. So a linear constraint would say that, uh, or a linear system would say that AX equals, or A, yeah, X equals zero, that just has only linear terms, whereas a affine thing could have an extra constant term. They're both sometimes called linear too, but sometimes in linear dynamical systems, people refer to it specifically in the case where there is no extra term here. And so I'll say affine just to be a little more um, concrete with normal terminology. And it's also important to know that all these constants here, these physical constants, as well as the time step delta t, so whatever that time was, could it be a second or five minutes, those were all folded into these constants here. So really, I guess k, I think we should define it here. So actually, what would k be here? In terms of all those constants we have. So there's, a, there's definitely a UA term. What was that? Uh, well, not just T. Yeah, there's a delta T term. That's our time step, because remember, what we're really doing is we're approximating XT plus 1 being equal to XT plus delta T times the time derivative of XT, which is given by those thermodynamic equations there. Um, so that, that, that comes in. And then, you know, it's just the actual derivative here that matters. So we can't have these terms there too. So we actually divide that side by that. So it really would be this over all these other constant terms that we have. So that would be what k is. Um, but the point is that we assume those are all known so we can compute k and we know what k is in this case. I'll leave it up for now. So now this is a system that describes how the state evolves, right, in response to, well, the current state, because the temperature has some sort of mass to it, in that, I know that that's kind of quite the right word, but <laughs> thermal mass, I'm using that term informally, um, because you can't change it initially, right, or instantaneously, rather. Uh, you probably do want to allow for some degree of, you know, if you, unless your heater is really, really powerful, uh, you probably can't immediately change what the temperature is going to be. Um, so this describes how the system actually evolves, but now let's talk about what should we do in terms of our control objective. So what's our cost function? And a simple example of a cost function we want, might want to optimize would, for example, be the cost of heating the room. Right? Maybe like the emissions cost if we're going to be more conscientious, but just let's talk about some cost of heating the room. and. For simplicity, let's just talk about uh, the cost of, um, let's assume that the cost of the room is in the actual cost of electricity. I think this is actually, is that right, cents per kilowatt hour? No, that should be dollars per kilowatt hour. That would be really cheap energy otherwise. Um, <laughs> those are the units. Uh, okay, so, so let's say that their costs, we're on some cost plan from our utility that charges us $1,000 
less during the night hours and then more during the day. Okay, so assume that's just given to us. We know what our costs are going to be ahead of time. And we know that if we use energy from, say, um, 7 to probably 5, it'll cost us 25 cents a kilowatt hour. And if we, if we this should really be dollars per kilowatt hour if there are fractions there. And if we use it in the other times, there'll be something like, you know, point eight eight cents a kilowatt hour. So our goal is now kind of twofold, right? We want to ensure the temperature is always within that desired bandwidth. That's also kind of a cost, but we're formulating it more as a constraint rather than a cost. Because we're just going to say we really, really don't want to violate that at all. That's the first element. But then secondary to that, we also want to minimize the cost of energy. How much it actually costs us to do that. And you can imagine now that given this structure, of what energy costs, we might want to do some interesting things, right? We might, suppose our temperature is very low at first, we might want to say heat up the room ahead of time when the cost of energy is very low. So we have to do less work when energy costs are high. And that's very kind of intuitive, but it's also things like, well, in the middle of the night, it's colder outside. And so it might actually be harder to heat things up. We need more energy to heat things up in some sense. So there are all these kind of interesting trade-offs you have here. They are not obvious exactly how you want to design this optimal policy. Um, and so the nice thing about optimal control in this framework is that it all comes out of the optimization problem. So let's just formulate this as an optimization problem and see what solution comes out of it. So here is our optimization problem. We're going to minimize over x and u, this is remember our optimal control formulation, this objective, c transpose u. c is a vector of those costs at every point in the day, and u is our do we turn on the heater, or how much do we turn on the heater variable? And we're going to scale this to be especially the same unit so that U is essentially expressed in kilowatt hours. U is the amount of energy we inject into the system. And our constraints are, well first of all we have to obey these dynamics here, these temporal dynamics of the system itself, has to obey that. Um, the first state has to be the initial temperature, whatever it really is when we start this system. So if we start in the middle of the night and it is in fact 50 degrees in the room, I guess 55 degrees is what I'm putting here, um, we better actually not try to set that arbitrarily in our, in our, in our mind when computing the solution here. We also are going to have vectors here of what the allowable temperatures are in terms of their lower and upper bounds. And these are a vector that will tell us for the whole day what can the temperature be? So it's actually important to know, x here is a vector, right, where each element of x corresponds to the, to the state at the given time. So I'm really sort of talking about the concatenation of all the different states rather than just one state. I'll use a subscript when I want to talk about one state and I'll use the, just the whole thing when I want to talk about all the states. And similarly, all the control inputs have to be bounded within some amount as well. We can't just set the heater as high as we possibly want, and maybe it's just the heater, so we can't also cool the room with the heater. Um, so they have to be bounded between, say, 0 and 1. Now let's see how we go about actually formulating this in a tool like Yelmet. Because this is the optimization problem, right? We have our, we want to minimize cost times the input, which is essentially our energy that we're using. So back to dynamics constraints, a bunch of other constraints, like it has to be in the initial state, we have to maintain x in a certain range, and we have to maintain our inputs within a certain range as well. Yeah? What does U less than 1 here just means that, I mean, it's, it can be sort of arbitrary. I'm just saying 1 is the most energy we can inject. I guess in the past thing I was saying that U is in units of kilowatt hours. Um, because the cost here is a big vector of cost per kilowatt hour, and so I'm saying this heater has a maximum power of one kilowatt hour. Yeah. 
sorry, maximum, <laughs> that wasn't right, a maximum energy of one kilowatt hour. Um, it's actually important to, to, to know, because we're talking in discrete time here, um, U actually has units of energy in this case, right? U in some sense is, you know, a heater should be, uh, talk about power. Just talk about the, the wattage of a heater, how many watts does it actually use. But remember, um, B, our constant B, contain both kind of the true wattage of the heater as well as our time step delta T. And so that will actually make U be in units of energy. I mean, sorry, rather if you don't include any units in B, if you're talking about B being unitless, just a number, um, because you need to effectively put in that time step anyway, uh, U has to be in units of energy. So in whatever time step we're talking about, let's say we're talking about I forget actually how many I have here. I think I probably have every 15 minutes or so. So I'm going to say over 15 minutes, you can consume at most one kilowatt hour. So you is, the heater is 250 watts. Not a very powerful heater, actually. This is a pretty wimpy heater. Um, that could be any number. But it could be any number, yeah. It's just, it's just, I mean, it's just arbitrary, right? And in fact, this number will only, the only thing, real sort of thing that matters here is how this number relates to the heat dissipation rate, that constant K that we have. That's what really matters in some sense, right? It's just, you know, this determines essentially how leaky the room is, and then this just determines how much we can, more we can pump in. Um, so what really matters is in some sense sort of how those two relate to each other. Okay, so let's set up this problem now. We have our variable X, which is T dimensional, right? Because we're doing it for all T time steps. T is in this case the whole day. We also have a bunch of U variables, which we set up as SDP vars, same dimension. And then we start adding constraints to our system. And the constraints, unlike a lot of the things you did before in machine learning, say, um, in these programs you typically have a lot of constraints. And we really have to build our constraints very intelligently. So, for example, we're going to say that one constraint is the fact that the first temperature has to be 55 degrees. Constraint number one. Um, constraint number two says that this encodes our dynamics of the system. It says that x i or t or i plus one equals x i plus k times the difference here plus b times the input. And I guess also the choice of B, if X is in units of energy, then B actually also scales the, you know, what, what the effective actual power of this thing is. So if there was no B there, if this was just between 0 and 1, then it would be 250 watts, but B can actually scale that. So you can actually have different absolute powers uh, for, your, for your heater, depending on how you actually scale B. So it's actually oftentimes nice to scale U to be in some kind of normal range that we know about, like 0 to 1, just so we think of it as how, you know, what percentage of it is it on, essentially. How much is it, how, how turned up is it where 1 is fully on and 0 is fully off. So we have this constraint, too, that for every time, we have to do it for every time, too, right? We have to make sure that this happens for every single time. The next state is determined by the previous state and the control. Then we'll add the bound constraints. So it has to be greater than the lower temperature and less than the upper bound of temperature. And these things, remember, are vectors that actually encode uh, that sort of process of when things can be on and off. So those are, this is TL, this is TU, those big vectors. Uh, and then C is between 0 and 1. So we set this all up like this, but this is actually pretty straightforward because we're just encoding this exact problem kind of as exactly how we see it. Right? Yeah. So you didn't put in the, like, on which time that the, you turn on the heater? I'm not telling you anything about when you should turn on the heater. That's, that's a very cool thing, actually. Is that I'm just saying, okay, look, all that matters is this, that this objective, we want to minimize the cost of energy that we're going to pay. And you better make sure to keep the temperature in this range when it's going on. And also, by the way, things like here's what the temperature outside will be and here's the dynamics of the system. 
but I'm not telling it when the heater is going to come on. It will actually find from this solution here the optimal schedule for the heater. So maybe it doesn't make sense to turn on the heater in the middle of the night. Maybe it does. It depends. But whatever that best thing to do is, it will find it. And in fact, here's what the best thing to do is. <laughs> okay, so here's what comes out. So, so we put this all into it, right? We put this into the program, and we call solve SDP with these constraints and this objective, which is the cost times, um, times U. And I guess the cost, you have to scale that appropriately to whatever you know, real sort of power or energy U corresponds to. But we solve this problem. And what we get out are two things. We get out a sequence of states and a sequence of controls. Those states, of course, have to be the ones that we would get if we execute those controls. Because by this constraint here, those states have to be the ones that we would actually result in. Um, and the controls, that's the interesting part, is that this problem is actually minimizing overuse. So it is picking the controls that are the best to use for the situation. And here's something we get out of it. So what we get is this very interesting behavior. This graph here shows you the state variables that we get out of it. This blue line here is the internal temperature, light blue line. And so what it does is it does sort of do this pre-cooling, right? It pre-cools up to here. It doesn't do it in the middle of the night because it's colder then. But it starts about here, lets it fall down there, and then restarts back up right before someone comes. And the reason it does this is what happened here is that the price of electricity went up right there. So what's really happening here is that during the control, the, the, this graph now shows the control input, which is the blue line, and electrical cost, which I rescaled to be in the, all on the same scale here. And essentially, in the night we have to actually use some amount of power because we have to maintain the temperature at this bound. Um, at a certain point, which is very hard to pick if you didn't know what was going on here, um, it decides to turn on all the way and start heating up the room. The reason why it does it earlier is because it knows that at this time, seven or eight or maybe, yeah, seven or so, the price of power will go up. And so it's better off using it right here. So once it goes off, up, it lets it cool off again. The reason why is that it's easier to heat the room here when the temperature's a little bit warmer than it would be to heat it here. So you let it cool off until you, right before someone comes in, you have to just turn the heater on again to make sure it's at the temperature. Then you sort of let it go. You keep it at the temperature as long as everyone's there. I guess you keep it always at the bottom temperature because there would be no point in making it hotter uh, given just, just about cooling in this task. Sorry, just, sorry, just about heating in this task. Um, and then when someone leaves, you just let it go off entirely and let it coast entirely during this time here. Then you heat back up again right before someone comes, keep it at that heat, and then let it trail off at the end of the day. Now this makes sense intuitively what's going on here, but I would never have been able to come up with this, right? This was actually the best thing to do, possibly. The really nice thing about this control formulation using optimization is that it, all this just comes out of the optimization problem. So we don't have to tell it what to do. We just tell it what we want to optimize. Right? We don't tell the system, turn on now. We tell the system, minimize cost. Yeah? So where in the model did you specify the, uh, I guess the, the bounds? The bounds here? Those were uh, these variables TL and TU. I just had set those up above here. Is there, did you have to put in like the hours? Um, I mean, again, it depends what the actual time step is. I think it's a 15 minute by 15 minute here or so. Um, so yes, you have to put in for what hours you want those things in whatever scale, whatever resolution you're using for your time step. Um, but other than that, you just let it go. Yeah. If you fix the U in between U and 1, yeah. how do you scale B? So again, all of these, the actual way that you get so what would B actually be then, I guess? So again, U is the energy we inject into the system, right? So B, in some sense, would be sort of the true wattage of the um, device times 
delta t, whatever that is, right? Uh, sorry, I should just say something like you know, the power of the device. times delta t, right? And that would be b. So to know what b is, we have to know, I mean, b also, like k, b also encodes constants of the system. And we're assuming it's all known. We know what the actual wattage of the heater is. So then therefore we know how much power it can, or how much energy it can produce during a certain amount of time. And that is all encoded into b. Um, we are assuming that we know the model of the heater, and so we know exactly how the heater will affect um, the evolution of the system. I mean, here they're just, no, I just picked numbers that, that sort of, that, that, that worked for the um, leakiness of this room, which I also just kind of picked. Um, in reality, you probably want to look up just the model of the heater, right, and say, okay, well, I mean, what you really should do, right, is you just look at the model of the heater, and you should also look up the leakiness of this room and you know, model that somehow, or look at the materials of the room and model exactly how the leakage all happens. Um, that's hard to do. So this is really just, I mean, this example is not, is not a real example in the sense that it's not a real room and a real heater. I'm picking these numbers to make the point. Um, but it's not unrealistic either. I mean, you could easily come up, you could easily backfit, I guess, in some sense, come up with a room and a heater that made this model work. Um, but the point, the point is more that these are all just physical properties of the system, the things that you can look up from physics. And then once you have this model, this paradigm will tell you how to control it in a way that actually works and accomplishes the thing you want. You could also, incidentally, and we'll talk about this later, um, use machine learning to learn what these things are. So if you don't know it, oftentimes you won't know it, right? Or maybe the actual model is a little bit more complex because there's you know, different sides of a room, um, all these things can be more complex, so we don't actually know it. And um, you might want to learn it from data. You know, observe sequences of controls and next states and learn what that relationship actually should be. We're not going to worry about that yet. We'll talk about that a little bit later on when we bring all these things together, power systems, machine learning, and control. Um, but for now, we'll assume we know that. Okay. Um, One more, you know what, I thought we'd get further, but I think I'll actually save this example for next time because I didn't want to hand back the homework and talk a little bit about the homework. Um, we'll talk next time about one more quick example of these things uh, for energy storage. Actually, no, I think I probably have time. We have, to, we have 20 more minutes, so I probably have time. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do one example really quickly, and the next time we'll be able to jump right into kind of more detailed treatment of actual dynamical systems. Okay, so this next task is a task of storing wind power to make more money on the market. So as we talked about last time, the price of electricity that a generator can actually sort of really make in some sense varies very wildly from time to time, right? These LMPs I was talking to you about before can really be pretty, be pretty crazy. And here is a graph of actual LMPs from, from um, some node in a system. This one actually might be from uh, uh, no, New England. Um, in addition to that, we also have some wind speed and a wind farm there. And this wind farm, um, we didn't cover this, but essentially the power a wind farm generates is actually goes up with the cube of the wind speed. So the power actually looks like this thing cubed and then rescaled. Don't worry about that if you haven't seen that before. So you have some power you're generating, and you have some price electricity, and now you want to say, well, if we could store some of this power, if we, if we, if we can't store it, then we'd have to just sell it at the current price, whatever that is, right? If we could store it, um, how much better could we do? Right? Maybe we would want to store it when the price was low, and then sell it when the price was high to make a bigger profit. In reality, the real advantage of this can come much more when we have large penetration of wind and things like that, and you actually can mitigate you know, the fact that these things, you don't know when the wind's going to blow, and so you have that, that issue. But let's just talk about a very simple case now where A, we know what the wind's going to be ahead of time, a very big assumption, and B, we also know what the price is going to be ahead of time, which is an equally big assumption. So given those both are very unrealistic assumptions, uh, in practice you would sort of make predictions of these things and go according to predictions, but again, we'll get to that later. 
how should you um, schedule a battery, a big battery if you have one, to actually make a profit from this? Um, I guess I said this before. So basically lacking, la lacking storage, we would just sell it whenever, whatever we generated right now, but if we have a battery, we can sell it when it's low and, and sell it when it's high and buy when it's low. Is that right? Sell when it's high, yeah. <laughs> Not buy anything. We just sell when it's high and store when it's low. Um, okay, so the state here is just going to be the energy we store in the battery, the time t. Really simple dynamics here. State's just the energy. Um, and u is going to be the energy we either put into or take out of the battery at time t. And the dynamics now are really, really simple. It's just, we'll assume the battery is lossless. And we're just going to say that xt plus 1 equals uh, xt plus ut. So you can be negative, it means we're draining the battery, and you can be positive, it means we're putting it into the battery. We also do want to enforce the fact that the state can never go negative. We can never have negative charge in the battery. So this will be another constraint, but the dynamics are very, very simple. There's also some external variables, things like the actual wind energy generated at time t by the turbine, and ct, which will be the cost of electricity at time t. So now the optimization problem is just we're going to minimize, or is it maximize maybe? I think, sorry, I think we might maximize this if we want to make money. Um, the cost actually depends how I, I think, I think I might have this order. No, you're, well, so if we're taking energy out, yeah, yeah, it should be maximized. So the cost of what we're selling minus whatever, or what the energy minus whatever we put into storage here, because if you take it into storage, you can't sell it then, or if you take it out of storage, then you do sell it, even if they generate no energy. So we minimize this, which is just the, the amount of energy, that, or amount of money we make from, from the energy. Subject to our dynamics here, our fact that we can't ever have the battery have negative charge, and it can't ever be more than some maximum amount. Another fact that we can't actually extract more or less than a certain amount of energy at any given time. So we, can, well, so we can only at most suck up some amount of energy, which I'm calling E ramp here, because we can't ramp up the storage in the battery too fast or ramp it down too fast. And then this little thing here, which just says that the um, U, rather E is always greater than or equal to U, meaning that we can't ever store more energy than we have um, wind. Right, we have to only be able to store the energy that actually is being, is this. We can give more out, of course, but we can't, put more into the battery than what we actually have uh, in the energy here. So I won't even write the Yama pro uh, program. It's very much like this. And what we get out is a schedule like this for the battery. So again, this is very interesting here, right? Because it sort of took in these inputs of the precise pattern of energy, the precise output here. And again, these are assuming these will be known, which is a big assumption, but assuming that they're known. Um, it comes up to this, this problem with the exact right schedule for how we should pull in storage of the battery um, and sell it to make the most profit you can. And what you see is, and I should have probably put this in the same, on the same graph, but basically this point here, you're selling a lot of energy, and that corresponds to a little spike in price right here. And similarly, another point where you're selling a lot of energy is right here, and that corresponds to a spike in price right here. So again, this is, a, this is sort of a, a toy example here, even more than the last one, because here we're assuming we know what the future energy is going to be. Uh, but this paradigm still is actually very transferable to cases where you don't know that necessarily. And we'll talk about how that works uh, in later classes. And it's incredibly powerful because, again, we're not prescribing an actual policy for the battery here. Right? I'm not telling it giving it some list of rules about when to pull an energy and when to push it out. That's very hard to do, actually. All I'm telling it is, your goal is to make money. As much money as you can. Here's the dynamics of the system. Do whatever you want to make that, to do that. To do it optimally, too. So hopefully this course gives some idea about the concept of control as optimization and the power of control as optimization. So, um, just to show some of the issues to come that we'll talk about in later classes. Um, first of all, these are very simple systems, and we'll talk about more complex ones next time. Um, secondly, and this is kind of a big problem here, is that we assumed dynamics were deterministic. There was no noise in the system. 
and that we knew the future of all the relevant variables. And what do you do when the dynamics are uncertain, or noisy maybe, and the predictions about the future are uncertain? It becomes trickier then. Um, in that case, exact solutions in the stochastic setting, so really you know, thinking about your true uncertainty, that often becomes very hard to solve. Not always, but it often becomes hard to solve. And so what we'll focus on really is a very powerful paradigm for addressing those problems very much like we have here. And this is called model predictive control. And the basic idea that we'll talk about sort of the, the formalities later is that you ignore uncertainty about the future, you just make your predictions, and you act as if you sort of had all that information. And you solve that problem every time. To solve that problem as we would before, ignoring the fact that we don't really know the future. But the one catch is you do this at every single instant of time, whatever your time sort of step is. You're resolving oscillation problem with whatever new information you got from the last time. Maybe things didn't evolve quite as you thought they would, and so you'd re-update it. And that ability to kind of always kind of account for changes, even though this is actually not the right thing to do, you should not, in theory, just assume your predictions are correct. This can be a very powerful paradigm, and it works really, really well in practice, and it's kind of become a workhorse for a lot of control problems that operate on this paradigm. So with that, this actually, I think, ends the, this set of slides. So we'll talk next time about the dynamical systems um, that we're going to cover here. Uh, but right now, I want to give back the homework and talk a little bit about that. But for this, I'll turn off the camera.